In this lecture, I will talk about the applications of financial statement analysis. Overall, this is a short reading and it is, it is quite simple. We aren't really learning anything new. It's simply that we are taking some of the concepts that we have learned over the last few uh, lectures on financial reporting and analysis and we are looking at how those concepts can be used for analysis. Obviously, one reason for looking at financial statements and studying financial statements is to evaluate the past financial performance of a company. Now, you might be interested in uh, analyzing a company to determine whether or not to invest in it. And among many other things, uh, you will certainly have to carefully look at and analyze the financial statements. When you analyze the financial statements, what is it that you are looking for? So you will look at have the ratios changed and why and obviously I'm not going to go over details here because we've done several lectures that talk about important ratios such as the current ratio, various uh, debt ratios and so on. Now obviously given the sort of analysis you are doing you need to figure out what are the most important ratios and then you need to look at how they have changed over time. How do key ratios and trends compare with competitors in the industry? Obviously, if you are doing uh, analysis to figure out which company to invest in, you want to look at different companies in a given industry to see which one has the best ratios. What aspects of performance are critical for a competitive advantage? Now, here again, given the company that you are studying and the industry that you are studying, you need to figure out what sort of things will give a company a competitive advantage and then what are the ratios that give you some indication of whether that company has a competitive advantage or not. As an example, if the competitive advantage in a given industry has to do with being the lowest cost provider. so. So if that is the nature of, a, of the competitive advantage in a given industry, typically this would be a mature industry, then obviously the ratios that you are looking at among others will be the various activity ratios which give a sense for how efficiently the company is running. So you will look at uh, activity ratios, you will look at things like the operating margin, etc. How did the company perform in these areas? So once you've identified the areas that a company needs to be good at, you look at how well it performed in those areas. And actually I've already alluded to this. So if a company needs to be a, a cost leader, then obviously you look at activity ratios, margin ratios, and compare those with other companies to see how well it, is, it has done. And then what is the business model and strategy and are these reflected in the key financial metrics? So again, if the strategy of a company is to be a cost leader, then you look at the various metrics and figure out whether those metrics tell you that this company is indeed a leader in that, uh, in that strategy. So in the previous slide, we talked about looking at past performance. As a financial analyst, it is extremely important for you to project future performance. Now, here is a simple model for how, uh, that, how this can be done. And we will also see this uh, material in corporate finance. So when you are trying to project future performance, typically the sales of a company are impacted by GDP. So you need to understand what's happening in the overall economy or economies where your target company is operating. So you need to figure out uh, what is the overall GDP growth. So if your company is operating in say North America, then what is the GDP growth in this region? Then you forecast the expected industry sales based on historical relationship with GDP. So if you are, for example, evaluating the cement industry, then you figure out what's how much the cement industry typically grows in relation to the GDP growth. So let's make a real simple example. Let's say that you project GDP to grow at 3%. And let's say that based on historical performance, the cement industry grows at the same rate as the GDP. 
so now you have an idea of the rate at which your overall industry is growing then the company that you are targeting you need to forecast the sales of that company so clearly let's say that the company you are targeting has a 25% market share in the cement industry now if you expect that uh, that market share to remain at 25% then you can make a simplistic assumption that the sales of this company are also going to grow at 25% on the other hand if you project that the market share will increase then you need to know have a projection of how much that market share will increase to and obviously factor that into your calculations overall point being that through these first three bullet points you basically come up with projection of the sales for your target company then you can use historical margins for stable firms and uh, to come up with the net income or you can project each expense item to come up with your net income and essentially and when you come up with net income you should remove any non recurring items so for example in a in let's say your current year uh, sales includes some sales from a uh, operation that will be discontinued then obviously for future sales projections you should not uh, fact as in you should factor in the fact that one business unit is being discontinued a little more detail on forecasting net income spreadsheet modeling or financial modeling is used extensively to forecast net income how do we do this i'm going to give a simplistic view and then if you really want to understand this in a little more detail i'd suggest you look at example 5 in the curriculum but for, from a exam perspective as long as you understand the basic points you should be all right so let's uh, so so what what do we do we've already talked about coming up with a revenue estimate then we need to make assumptions about cost of goods sold sales general and administrative so sgna as a portion of sales so based on past performance you might say that cogs is 50% and sgna is 20% of overall sales so that means that you can project that if revenue is 100 then our cogs is going to be 50 so we can then say that our gross uh profit is 50 from that we subtract out s g and a which we are saying is approximately 20% of revenue subtract that out so that gives us a certain number we also obviously need to project things like depreciation come up with our operating income then we have to figure out what our interest rates are so what's our interest expense what are our tax rates and based on all these assumptions we come up with our net income we do this for next year for the year after that and so on so we can do this for as many years as we want that will give us projections of net income a couple of points here generally things like cogs and sg and a tend to be a percentage of revenue whereas interest rates tend to be obviously based on the 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 interest expense tends to be based on interest rate as well as the total amount of our liabilities or at least the interest bearing liabilities so if our uh, if we are projecting a reduction in the company debt then obviously the interest expense will go down similarly to come up with the tax expense we have to project what the tax rates will be and then apply those tax rates to the earnings before tax so the whole point being that these are two items that typically are not simply taken as a percentage of revenue but we need to do a little more analysis to come up with our interest expense and our tax expense what about uh, cash flow again uh, just a, as a quick refresher it's important to project net income but a lot of analysis is based on cash flows and as you will see in the lectures on corporate finance the way you evaluate several projects is by coming up with the present value of future cash flows uh, even in equity analysis we are often concerned with what the cash flow will be so clearly it is important to forecast cash flows and this again is done using spreadsheet modeling or financial modeling now cash flows 
involve many of the things that we do with net income plus a few more so we need to also make assumptions about working capital so how much investments are we making in working capital so if there is a increase in working capital obviously that is a cash flow but note that increase in working capital isn't 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 directly reflected in our income statement but it reduces our cash flow so we need to cover this what about investments in fixed assets any increase in fixed assets obviously is a cash flow so that needs to be considered money that we are sp spending on our supplies cogs that needs to be considered money that we are spending on our uh, sales and administrative expenses so all these factors need to be considered in order to come up with our cash flows similarly our interest expense in terms of actual cash that we are paying or, or the interest expense that we are actually paying that is based on interest rates as well as based on uh, our debt outstanding how much taxes are we actually paying how much dividends are we paying so all these factors need to be considered in order to calculate our cash flows so essentially we can make our assumptions and project cash flows into the future again i'd encourage you to look at example 5 which shows how we can project both net income as well as cash flows now over the next couple of slides we are going to talk about both uh, analysis from a credit perspective and then from a equity perspective a larger point here is this as a investor you might be either evaluating a company based on a equity investment where you are considering buying shares in that company or you might be evaluating a company from a credit investment perspective so if you are buying bonds that a company is issuing then you need to do some sort of a credit and uh, assessment because if you buy the bond then essentially you are concerned about how how well or the ability of the issuer to meet the interest and principal payments so if you are holding this bond obviously you are going to get interest payments and principal payments but before investing in this bond you want to figure out will the company be able to meet its interest obligations and principal repayment obligations on time now how do you do this some general points over here and this again is covered in a lot of detail in level 2 but the general points are obviously you need to look at the cash flow so very simplistically put if the company that you are investing in has good positive cash flows and the cash flows are forecasted to be good then you can be the, then you can be comfortable that this is a relatively safe investment another thing that you look at is the variability of cash flows so obviously if the variability of cash flows is high then you'll be concerned that at times when the cash flow is low when will the company make its payments at that time so high variability is bad high cash flow forecast is obviously good as a general point when you do credit uh, assessment you need to look at the four c's of credit analysis which are character capacity collateral and covenants these are covered again in fixed income securities but very briefly character refers generally to the quality of the management team so if you have a very strong management team good track record and the company also has a good track record of making payments on time and so on then we can say the character is good capacity i have alluded to above so this is the capacity to pay a company that is generating good solid cash flows obviously will have a high capacity to pay collateral refers to what is the collateral behind this bond or behind the debt instrument if we have good strong collateral supporting or behind the bonds that have been issued then obviously an investor can feel more comfortable and covenants covenants refers to the rules and regulations associated with this bond so these are the promises that the issuer makes such as that the company might say that they will not issue any other debt that is senior to this debt so we look at the types of covenants and determine if the covenants are strong and investor friendly then this also is favorable again these are covered in a little more detail when we talk about fixed income securities later in the course there are several credit rating agencies such as s&p moody's etc and these study companies 
and issue credit scores or credit ratings for different companies as well as credit ratings for specific issues or specific bond issues from that company and what do these companies or credit rating companies do they basically employ formulas that are based on financial numbers ratios and business characteristics so if they are giving a credit rating to a given company such as say general electric they will look at the company's scale how well is it diversified how well are the operations diversified margin stability means do the margins of the company remain more or less stable or are the margins up and down a lot how much leverage has the company taken so based on these characteristics and several more a company will receive a credit score or a credit rating so for example uh, i don't know this for a fact but i suspect the ge probably has a high credit rating as an investor when you see that a company has a good credit rating obviously that gives you uh, a comfort feeling but as an investor you obviously should look at what credit ratings uh, or credit scores are being given by entities like s&p and moody's but a sophisticated investor will always do a credit rating or credit scoring of his own obviously uh, when we are looking at credit scores and credit rating we should also consider business risk versus financial risk and very briefly business risk refers to the risk that is inherent in a business so examples of business risk might be that sales might end up being less than expected or expenses might end up being more than expected and because of these our operating income might be less than expected financial risk is the risk that companies take because of leverage so companies that have high levels of debt obviously will have higher financial risk obviously there is more to this but for now that what i have just said should be sufficient now what do you do uh, when when you have equity investments obviously then your analysis strategy will be slightly different and in terms of the learning objective statement that uh, the cfa has given over here you just need to know the basics of uh, screening and what this means effectively the idea is this let's say you are looking at a universe of a thousand plus shares or stocks and let's say that you are a value investor so a value investor is someone who is looking at stocks that have uh, relatively low pe ratios maybe relatively high dividend yield so what you can do here is you can possibly take this huge database of a uh, thousand shares and run a screen on these thousand shares where you say uh, give me all the stocks that have pe ratio less than 15 and a dividend yield of greater than 5% and this might spit out say a uh, 100 shares that meet this screening criteria and then you can dig a little deeper into these shares and determine which are the ones that you want to invest in if somebody else is a growth investor then obviously their screening might be slightly higher they might look at things like the growth rates relatively higher pe ratios and so on so screening is used by all sorts of investors you know what sort of an investor you are and then based on the sort of investor you are you figure out what are the what are the relevant ratios and uh, and other criteria you use that criteria to screen out the particular shares that you want obviously this is just one step you then obviously once your screening process has given you some shares then you need to study those shares in more detail an important concept here is that of back testing so let's say that based on your procedure you come up with 100 shares and then whittle that down to 10 with these 10 shares you should also do something called back testing so you should say that if i had invested in these 10 shares over the last 5 years what would my return have been so this process is called back testing and it helps you evaluate whether these shares would have been a good investment over the last 5 years when you do back testing you should look out for both survivorship bias and look ahead bias i think the one that is more important from a exam perspective is survivorship bias and the idea with survivorship bias is as follows in these 100 stocks 
the chances are that the stocks that are being listed in this database are only the stocks the thousand that have survived so these are the stocks that are currently being traded you might have 200 shares that have dropped out over the last few years and this implies that the shares that have survived are the ones that are the better ones so any analysis that you do or the performance that you evaluate for these thousand will be overstated because we are not counting the the poorly performing 200 shares that have dropped out and we can we can be reasonably confident that if 200 shares dropped out over the last couple of years then clearly there will be some shares from this group of 100 that will drop out in the future but from an exam perspective basically what you need to know is that uh, you have to watch out for survivorship bias the other bias that you should watch out for is look ahead bias this is a little bit complicated i think it is safe to say right now that uh, that look ahead bias has to do with the timing of data and the point being that many stocks in here will have restated their financial numbers so stocks in your financial database will have uh, financial numbers that have been restated and those restated numbers might be different from the numbers that were used by investors in the past to make investment decisions i know there is more to that explanation but uh, but just for now remember that look ahead bias is one of the things you need to be concerned about when you do back testing the final point in this reading is that uh, analyst must make adjustments so if you are comparing different companies you need to make adjustments for different accounting choices and standards if you are comp comparing company a in the us versus company b in the eurozone company a might use lifo accounting so a might be say ford b might be bmw that is using fifo accounting so obviously if they are using different accounting standards then the numbers reported for say inventory and activity ratios and so on will be different as an analyst you need to bring both on the same base and bringing both to the same base is effectively the adjustments that we are talking about different companies might make different depreciation choices you need to make sure that when you are comparing then if they are purely differences based on estimates they need to be adjusted revenue recognition might be different across different companies so again this is uh, all these things you have studied before so if these things look new to you then i would be concerned that means you need to go back and revise all we are saying here is if different companies are using slightly different rules you make adjustments to bring them on the same page a related point is that the overall accounting standards one company might be using ifrs another might be using us gap so we have to make adjustments so that both companies are being evaluated based on uh, similar assumptions so that is it as always practice hard post comments if you have any and click on the like button if you like this video